Hi, today we're going to start uh, video snippets of my dragon book. Uh, this is not your ordinary dragon book. Nope, 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 nope. Um, the title <laughs> is more than a mouthful. Betagis Wedawiskzulumzen is his name. Um, so for purposes of easiness for me, um, pretty much throughout the book, except when I need to do otherwise, I will shorten his name to the name that his friends call him, Beta. Um, but if you're ready, we'll read the first chapter today. Um, this is Beta Gisqueta Wadul Zagunzen, A Dragon's Journey. Here we go. Berigesquetawakjuksulumzen lived in a bad part of town. Well, there really wasn't a town. Its cave and the horde inside on which the dragon slept was hidden deep below a mountain called the Traveler, which is still located in Pis Piscataquis County, Maine. Piscataquis is Abenaki for branch of the river, just as Berigesquetawakjuksulumzen is Abenaki for Thunder, Fire, Mountain, Wind. Its parent and its friends just called it Betta, for short. Sometimes Betta wished that his parent had named it something easier and quicker to say, but most of the time, Betta liked its dragon name. That's because Betta Gisweta Wakzuzun Zemzen was a dragon. Yes, a real dragon, with two wings, four legs, not two-legged like the wyverns that lived somewhere in the woods in the west of the three streams down southwest in Franklin County, who were rumored to have come to Maine after life got a little too crowded in Wessex. That's in England. Fiery breath, scales that shone in the sun like a thousand shimmering silver shields and all. Betta was probably the last real dragon, again, not to say anything bad about the wyverns, they just weren't dragons, still to live in Maine, or for that matter, anywhere northeast of Boston. The rest of the older dragons had moved years ago to the warmer climes of exotic places like the Everglades, which had become kind of a retirement community in Florida for aging and retired dragons, regardless of whether they flew or swam. And Happy Jack, near the campground of the same name in the still wild and wonderful national forest that lies north of Phoenix and south of Sedona, a place that still oozes mellow vibes and powerful auras that are the gold of the spirit in warm and sunny Arizona. Before Betta's parent left for points south and warm, its sire came to it atop their mountain to give the young dragon its blessing. Betta's parent, as its father and its mother, laid its chin atop Betta's head. Betta closed its eyes and knew that its parent did the same. The masculine aspect of Betta's parent passed the fierce essence of its pride and its fire and its wisdom and its love to its son. And the feminine aspect of Betta's parent caressed its darling child with the joy and pride and kindness and care it had first felt when Betta had burst the bonds of its hatching as its daughter. Betta immersed itself in its parents' gifts, taking them deep within itself and making them the buttresses that allowed its soul to arc toward the heavens in the same mysterious manner that Betta absorbed precious gold, treasured metals, and cherished gems as the young dragon flew over them. Then Beta stayed on top of its mountain and watched its parent change within the next two short minutes from the center of its life into a small and then even smaller dot that graced the sky flying toward the south and forever in its, into its memories. A dragon? Probably the first question anyone who isn't a dragon or knows nothing, really, other than the claptrap that human books and movies have spread about dragons is, are dragons male and female, hims and hers? from a human perspective, and based upon what human adults think mostly about, that's a good question. But reality, as it always is, is a little more complicated when it comes to dragons. Dragons are completely male and completely female. When a dragon needs to create its offspring, an egg forms in its belly, well, abdomen, and grows there until it's time for the egg to be placed in the dragon's nest. And then the egg develops and eventually hatches, and the world is blessed by another dragon. How long does this take? is usually a question that humans ask when they discover that dragons, except for the sea serpent varieties, are not products of live births. The hatching doesn't happen quickly. The hatching doesn't happen according to a schedule. It happens when it happens, 
The wormling hatches when it decides that it's ready to hatch. If the dragon's parent is content to leave that first important decision up to its splendid whelp, you should be satisfied with that answer. More questions? What about the hordes? A reasonable second human question that reflects certain primal human um, attributes. Lust first and then greed. A dragon guards its horde because, well, maybe that's Maybe because the horde is an integral to the dragon as lust and greed are to humans. Oh, I know, that's probably a little too snide. My bad. Maybe it would help explain exactly how a dragon amasses its horde. When a dragon flies over or swims near its treasure, for thousands of years this was mostly done after the humans had mined and refined and hammered precious metals into useful and decorative shapes, art, altars, jewelry, royal weapons that not that knighted but never took a life, and decorated their creations with radiant crystal and gems wrenched from the earth and then cut and polished to reflect the glory of their owners. Before humans arrived, well, that was more elemental. While the prize might technically still be in the possession of a human, that was not to be the case for long. The gold or silver or other precious metals or cherished jewels of the treasure are absorbed into the dragon, molecule by molecule. These riches are attacked attracted to the dragon's body like basest iron is pulled to a magnet. Later, when the dragon reaches its cave and settles itself onto its hoard, the precious treasure that it has absorbed leaves its body in sweet, dear, golden tears. As the dragon's tears fall to become part of its cherished cash, they become again what the humans have made, rings, necklaces, bracelets, goblets and grails, plates of gold or silver, coin, and a hundred hundred other prizes, now the beloved possessions of a proud dragon, and some foolish men and women who would steal the dragon's tears. But how, the inquiring human mind might ask. It's just simple physics, the dragon mind would answer. Everyone knows just enough physics to understand that an atom is made of a nucleus and an electron cloud, and even its itsy-bitsiest little subatomic level, there is some elbow room between an atom's electrons and its nucleus, as well as between the protons and neutrons that make up the nucleus itself. The elbow room is just empty space with nothing at all there at all. But protons, neutrons, and electrons, the big three of subatomic particles, are more than that they at first appear. They are quantum objects. Just as I am my father's son at the same time that I am my son's father, these quantum objects exist simultaneously as particles and as waves. The wave function of these objects is the way that a particle's location in the atom is diffused or spread out. Electrons, for example, orbit their atom's nuclei, hurtling around at about 22,000 kilometers per second, and these orbits extend from the furthest reaches of the electron cloud and into the nucleus itself. So the space in the atom isn't really empty, but none, none of these tiny particles crash into one another. If only the I-5 in Los Angeles could have the same safety record. And while the big, and while the subatomic big three are busy doing what they do, they are also exchanging carriers, electromagnetic photons and weak field bosons. By the way, there is no number of bosons that cannot occupy the same quantum state. The empty space in an atom is filled brimful of these little quanta carrying forces. And these little carrying forces carry the gold and the platinum and the silver and the copper and theoretically any metal and even diamonds and emeralds and sapphires and rubies to the drag. A quantum, the plural is quanta, is the smallest amount of anything that can be involved in an action. Anything that is physical can be quantized and that specific unique quantum has a uniquely specific size or magnitude. So there exists a single quantum of gold, or a single quantum of silver, or a single quantum of diamond of an exact size. When a dragon requests it, a gold quantum, for example, moves from its natural stable place in its gold atom through the space between the atom's subatomic particles and then across a much larger space to the dragon who called to it and who then absorbs it. Or to put it another way, so the teeny tiny dragon called the teeny tiny gold quantum to its teeny tiny body and then went back to its teeny tiny cave where it cried teeny tiny tears and added the teeny tiny gold to its teeny tiny hoard. Hey, you might protest, that ain't physics, that's metaphysical. You might be right. But just like light is both a wave and a particle, a dragon is both physical and metaphysical. More questions? Okay, but just one more. Please make it a good one. How do dragons communicate? 
Dragons are expressive creatures. When a dragon talks to its whelp or a wormling to its parent, dragon speech is often soundless. The same whispered voice that the dragon uses to call its to its treasure, it uses to tell its child of the things it cannot communicate with its eyes or its touch. When a dragon talks to an intruder, a thief, or someone soon to be no longer alive, dragon speech is deafening. While you might not have trespassed on a dragon's realm, attempted to steal a dragon's trove, or angered a dragon to the point of lethality, you have been close to those who have. You've heard dragons announcing their animosity. Have you stood on the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains near Colorado Springs where warm, moist air lifted by the currents flowing over the mountain strikes cool, dry winds off the Great Plains collide? The clouds scream and the lightning strikes like explosions all around? Have you waited in the Huachuca Mountains in Arizona for the thunderstorms in July? Have you stood on the plains of Texas, Oklahoma, or Kansas and heard a train barreling down upon you? Have you walked outside in the winter to listen to a blizzard howl like a monstrous frozen wolf? If you have, you've heard dragons speak. Maybe the earth has moved beneath your feet and you've heard the tread of the dragon as it walked past you. Those whispers are what you might hear when the dragon is close. But thanks to the cleverness of humans, dragons have been able to communicate with their kind almost anywhere in the world. When humans first began to build and use telephones and then computers, they unwittingly helped the dragons that had up until then been separated and solitary in their caves and locks and oceans communicate in a completely unexpected manner. The circuit boards, processors, and memory, which are used in every computer, every cell phone, and every piece of telecom hardware made by man use copper, silver, palladium, platinum, and gold. These and these precious metals are the same ones that mankind has used for almost 10,000 years to create the opulence that dragons require. With this technology, the dragons have learned how to call to these dearest materials, and instead of <coughs> drawing these riches into themselves to be later added to a hoard, or to use the gold and silver and other shining metals as a means of calling to their own dear ones, friends and family. Betta stayed on top of its mountain, watching the sky to the southwest until the sun had fled the sky and the stars of the Milky Way sparkled in the heavens. Tomorrow, Betta would begin to add to its hoard. From the day it had hatched, Betta and its parent had shared the hoard, and Betta's parent had taught it the skills that Betta would need to locate its own treasure, the techniques Betta would use to call its riches to it, and the tricks Betta would need to know to safeguard its trove. Now that Betta's parent had left, left it, the hoard that they had shared for over five centuries was Betta's own. But tomorrow was another day, and now Betta was tired and a little lonely and quite a bit sad. Its parent had told Betta that it would use the, use the treasure in the human lines that crisscrossed the land, and even Betta's cave beneath the traveler to speak Betta as soon as its parent reached its new home. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe the day after that. Betta decided that it would find new treasure for its hoard that it could boast of to its parent. Betta's parent would smile when it heard Betta's prideful crowing, and Betta would feel its parent's smile no matter how many miles separated them. Betta itself smiled to think of that. But now, Betta's eyes were growing heavy, so it snuggled down into the gold and silver of the hoard, tossing aside a gem-encrusted crown that poked into its side. Betta wrapped its tail around its body, lay its head down, and slept, dreaming of a great golden parent carrying Betta south. <laughs>